So, um, yeah, that's a little interesting thing to note that uh, they were trying to do their own music, but the, the, they didn't execute it as well as they could, you know, just basic rock and roll. Hmm. And maybe that just had to do with the, you know, spiritual misalignment they were having at that point, them not liking each other and being in a dismal... They, they, this was a dismal studio they were in for this recording. Oh, okay. All right, so anyway, that's the whole uh, basis of the beginning. Uh, C, C over B, A minor, A minor 7. That's G, D, and the timing is uh, one, two, three. So it's just one and five and one and four, you know. Mm -hmm. Now we go to the release. Seventh, they do okay. make that seventh happen. Um, Can you run through that pattern and yeah, that's, say what you've yeah, got here? Yeah, it's B flat, D minor, G minor, A minor, A minor seven, B seven. Oh yeah. And this, this is definitely has McCartney's stamp. Lennon wouldn't modulate like this. Oh, okay. This is a little bit more. Um, what are we? What are we going for before that B flat? We're coming from. Oh, uh, before the B flat comes in, like how do we get there? Yeah. That's the interesting thing. It's, it's just all we hear is the bass drum. So it's uh, uh, uh. Oh, sorry. We're going home. So we just jump right in. Yeah. Now. When you modulate like this, it's a good idea, if you're in two different keys, uh, it's hard to find a key that has none of the notes of another key. Okay. Uh, you'd have to go the absolute opposite direction on the circle of fifths. In other words, the opposite key to C is F sharp. Okay. And uh, let me just think for a second. But even there, there's a common tone between those two keys. There's a B note common to both. Okay. So to get opposite keys, you'd have to go actually D flat would be a key that has, no, even D flat has, has common notes to the key of C. There's got to be some, I don't know if there is even a key that doesn't share at least one note with another sure, key. Okay. But in any case, when you're modulating to different keys, it's good to have like a pivot, pivotal anchor point where you can move like, uh, make a connection between those two keys. And actually this, uh, this kind of thinking ha has a lot to do with my ability to navigate jazz chord changes. Okay. This kind of thinking. Um, so, in any case, you know, we, we're in the key of G. Let me see if I could figure out. Let me just think for a second what key this is. Is uh, B flat, D minor, G minor. B flat, D minor, G minor. Or B flat, D minor. Uh, it, it's, it's vague what actual key. It's either F or B flat. Okay. Uh, so we're taking chords from either of those templates will accommodate the chords that are coming up right now, in other words. Oh, okay. And our pivot note is D, which is both in a G chord, using this configuration, and the B flat chord gives us a common tone between to anchor onto between both keys. All right. Okay. So that's, you know... Then I had memories... And that's so pretty. That, and that's yeah. evocative of um, here, there, and everywhere. Okay. If you if you could hear that. Uh, uh,
similar things like that, like um, uh, that kind of modulation is G to B flat. The same thing is happening in this song, G to B flat. Okay. Okay. Um, this is a very McCartney-esque one. Lennon would not do these kinds of modulations, uh, rarely. Okay. Um, he, Lennon was more fond of whole step modulations, and he did a great job with them, and so did McCartney, actually. They, they're tons of whole step modulations. This one is slightly more on the tacky side. Just slightly, not not Barry Mantle or tacky, but definitely somewhat tacky. Yeah. Um, and again, this is what I call the parallel major minor relationship, parallel relative major minor relationship. I know that's a lot of words, but if you were to take the key of B flat, which is the key we've moved to in the release, right? Its relative minor key is G minor. Okay. And G minor is parallel minor to G, G major. Right. So this is an old trick, you know. There is a connection between these two because of the relative minor root, okay? Uh, so that's how that works. It's a cute little trick, and it works very nicely. And coming back home is so wonderful. Uh, again, the, when you hear the A minor chord come in, you know you're coming back home to G. And there's this kind of breath of fresh air, like tension has been set up. We're in another key now. We've got mm -hmm. flats in this key. So... <laughs> Very pretty the way it takes us back home. Sure. All right, so that's that. That's a B flat, D minor, G minor, A minor, A minor seven, D seven. That's the A minor is the thing that really takes us home. And again, you have to be careful because you're singing in the key of B flat, so your melody note wants to link between the two keys. Okay. Uh, there's our, like, D, D, the D note seems to be the real linking factor throughout this whole section. Road that stretches out so, you know, he's, he's really leaning on that to get us through both keys nicely. Yeah. You know? Now, do you think they would find this stuff sort of just by dinking around on the guitar, or... Did he have, at this point, did McCartney say, kind of know what he's doing within that stuff? Yes, I think yes. My opinion uh, is yes and no. I, I, I think, you know, like when I teach lead guitar, whenever one of my students, like, uh, innovates their own kind of lick that sounds like them, I stop them and say, that lick, that is you. Oh. Uh, put that in your bag of licks and keep it. You know, for when you go out there and you want to increase what's in that bag of lifts. You want to have a whole bunch of okay. lifts to just draw from. I think what happened in both Lennon and McCartney's case, we'll see this in I Dig a Pony, actually, again. The, their, their writing, in a way, comes a lot from past experience. They knew, well, if I do this or if I do that, it's going to sound like this. Let me try it here and see how it works. Like, you know, the uh, I'm So Tired where... Um, uh, oh, wait, uh... This uh, B7F is very unique and, and very spicy, and Lennon took that sound and used it in a couple of occasions. Sometimes they don't even do it in different keys. They use the same exact chords that they used in another song and just do it again to see, well, maybe that'll work. It worked before. Ah, okay. And the Beatles had this wonderful penchant of being able to uh, rip other artists, not really rip, but like reinterpret other artists, and reinterpret even themselves, and yet come up with something that sounded new anyway. Sounded new. You right. know, that was part of their brilliance, you know. Um, so, I pointed to, like, like McCartney's here, there, and everywhere, going up to this key of B-flat, I want her everywhere, and when she's beside me, I know I didn't ever care. So you see your G minor here, mm -hmm. right, relative minor. Started in B-flat, but he's going over there. Not to love her is to now that D7 could either resolve to G minor or G major. And then we have that fresh air, that release. Yeah. Yeah. And we get similar here, you know, there's tension build up built up when you modulate, you know. And when the release comes, it's kinda like, ah, oh, ah, oh, here we are, back home again, you know. This made this particular number, if for some reason is it just as you talked through it and everything. It's one of those things where you, you go, well, what did you get? The melody first? Or did you get the music first? Or when did they come together? Uh, and, and, and how? Because 
there's so many times where the vocal, the vocal really kind of has to fit in a certain pocket. Mm -hmm. And times when maybe they would experiment with a different different cording or whatever that maybe they change that to fit. I don't know, but it it does. It's that. It's I'm I'm wondering if it's the chicken or the egg. You know, came first. Is that? Could you could you kind of expand on that a little bit? I didn't quite get it all. Well, it, it, some some people like Paul Simon for okay a number of albums. Once he had a rhythm, he would start figuring out everything else. Yeah, and, oh. and the lyrics might come last. Right, right, right. But once he had a rhythm, that that was the basis for him being able to find <clears throat> find a melody for things. Right. And then to you know be more sophisticated with riffs and whatever. But. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. As far as the approach to songwriting, um, you know, there are so many ways to, to skin a cat. You know, uh, like for example, I think um, the Police. A lot, the reason why a lot of their songs were unique in their early days was that Sting. I think he wrote bass lines and then sang over them. Oh, is that right? You know. Uh, I think he just did those four notes and sang over it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so there's that approach, like you could go by a bass line, and the melody, because it has opposing notes, suggests certain chords are happening. Okay. You know? That's one approach. What I used to do when I was younger, writing pop songs, is I'd be driving down to school or whatever, and um, I would think of some twist turn of a phrase, and I thought, oh, that'd be a good song title. And then I'd start singing melodies on that phrase and, and working it until I found a melody I felt was hooky, you know, like a pop song hook. And then I would go home and, you know, sometimes I'd jot it down on music paper and then go home and see how I could work it. Yeah. You know? um, there's the way of being inspired by chord progressions, you know, like... I was going to bring this up. Uh, this is a, mainly because I saw him a week and a half ago or so. Peter Himmelman, who my claim is, he's Dylan's uh, son-in-law and lives out here in Santa Monica. But he, in, he's so great because he will be kind of freeform and work off an audience and things like this. Or whatever just comes into his head. He had a band behind him, that guys he's known for a long time. Uh, and they kind of just roll with him. But... The, this, his one of his most famous songs is Mission of My Soul and if you saw it on it'd be easier to explain actually if you pulled it up uh, and we can do that after you know, after, after okay. we're done but here's what he did when he was sitting up there was he started playing these four chords and he said 20 minutes that's all he did 20 minutes he just kept playing this this progression and that tune came to him because of that was, you mean he was doing this live, or, or yeah? Well, when he was, he was just he started playing those chords, and he kept playing them, kept playing them. And, and then a melody and, and came then, to his mind, or? then yeah, then he threw in, you know, I I played this for about twenty minutes, and we all knew what song it was. But I played this for about twenty minutes, and then it all started coming together. It was just <laughs> well, you know, speaking of that whole process, you know, when I was in high school, I was hanging out with a couple of music nerds, and we were had a band. And we actually kind of had very Beatlesque roles. I was kind of the McCartney of the band, and my buddy Fred was kind of the Lennon, and my buddy Rich was kind of the Harrison, kind of dark, poetic uh, thing going on for that guy. Well, we all had our poet, poetic side, you know. But um, uh, what we we used to work like together sometimes to write music, or sometimes we'd write separately. And we our thing was we'd go to parties quite often and bring our acoustics. And, you know, everybody would be partying, we'd be drinking, smoking pot, and all that other stuff, and, you know, uh, somebody would say something, and we'd turn it into a piece of music. Yeah. Well, there was one time uh, I was working, forgive me for this, Charlie, uh, I had a, um, a classmate mate by the name of Charlie Grimaldi, and uh, he we were doing some sort of... Uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, civic work or something like that, volunteer stuff. And it was very loose and relaxed kind of work, so I'd bring my guitar down there. And Charlie never would make it to work. 
So one day, uh, Charlie finally showed up, and uh, we wrote this uh, Charlie Grimaldi, uh, Charlie Grimaldi finally came to work. <laughs> and we start singing this for how Charlie hated it, he got so mad at us. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, we would do stuff like this at parties, we'd make stuff up, and, and you know, if it stuck with us, we'd go back home and write it, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's another way. You know, yeah. Uh, another way is to become so familiar with the template and the relationships that you could hear them in your head. You know, so, so this is kind of what you have. You can listen immediately when you listen to a song. You know exactly what. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And that's that was another thing. Like you know, when I was playing at the old novel cafe, I had like a bunch of create. My audience was really a lot of creative people, and they would request all sorts of weird stuff. And this one guy, Steve, used to push me, push me a bit. And uh, he'd say, like, make something up right now, you know. Uh, and the easiest thing in the world for me, you know, really is I'm not bragging about that. It's just yeah. so easy. I just know that chord relationships will work. Yeah. I'll make something else, uh, something up right now. A minor to D minor to G to A minor. Or if I want to give it a different feel, uh -huh. you know, that sort of thing. You could just do whatever rhythmically there's a limit to the amount of chords you could write i mean you know especially if you're staying within the template there's not you know <laughs> i'm always amazed that people can write a song within the template itself without barring outside key chords and and do something really interesting with it oh, okay. you know sure. that that i'm always impressed with sure um, so one other thing about the song i'll just mention quickly is uh, it was a confusion for me there's also a david bowie song that does this sort of thing when i heard all right, like if I count like this, one, two, three, four. So this is right on the first note is right on the downbeat, but I used, the first time I heard the song, I heard it off of the downbeat because there was no, there was nothing to say where the one was. Okay. So I heard it like one, two, three. Da, 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 da. So I'm hearing a pickup. You, you hear the difference? Yeah. One, two, three. As opposed to one, two, three, four. Yeah. You know? So that was just a little, it's kind of like those optical illusions, you know, do you see two vases facing each other sure. or is it two faces? You know? <laughs> sure. I, I mean a vase or two faces. It's an Escher song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a David Bowie song that does that too. I think it's China Girl. It starts off with the uh, type of thing that kind of uh, lit there, and when you first hear it, you, the one could be anywhere. No. You know, it could be a pickup or or a one. So uh, that's a cute little device that that that's interesting. Like you fool the listener into thinking you're on one particular beat, but when you bring the band and you're really on. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. It, it does settle. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, it reveals itself. Right? There's some that don't. Like really? and, uh, to this day, Jimi Hendrix is all on the Watchtower. Yeah. The first line. <laughs> When I hear that, I can't tell where on the beat it is. I still, to this day, I still can't tell, like, how that worked. Huh. You know? One, two, three. That's how I hear it. Yeah. But whenever I hear the actual recording, you can tell the downbeat is elsewhere. And I was never able to, I have it so stuck in my head yeah. one way that I can't unhear it. That's how long is it before it settles into something? Uh, is it right question. after that? Good question, yeah. I think, uh, then you hear the... Like the drums go bop bop bop, oh, okay. and then like the beat gets like defined, but it's I can't hear it beforehand. It's really funny. I have it so locked in my brain, Jeez. I can't even hear it. Okay. So I always hear it strangely, and I, I play it the way I hear it too. When I do that song, I just play it the way I hear it. Yeah. Nobody notices, you know. People aren't gonna. They're not gonna be saying, "Oh, that's White Boy Hendrix." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, listen, I think in, in order to do the download, I think we need to end here. Well, we've had a wide-ranging thing today, not just Beatles, but uh, uh, we will get onward next time. Yeah, well, half of it is these little kind of side notes and stuff. Yeah, well, and it's, for me, it's stuff, uh, helpful little learning tips about songwriting, so that's fine.